Mike, that's me. Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler, and we've got our special friend and guest, uh, AJ Vickery. You can hear him all the time on uh, the Get Connected radio show that we do. We've got a, a fascinating show. Later on in the program, we'll be talking about digital trolls, these creeps, these jerks that prey on people online and harass them while they're getting organized. We are going to be talking to a media anthropologist about what's happening and what we can do about it. Uh, don't forget to check out the contest we have going on now as well. You can uh, go to our website and to enter, it's so simple. All you have to do is subscribe to our e-newsletter and you will be entered in forever for all the new contests coming up. We're giving away thousands of dollars of prizes this year and we want you to win some of that stuff. Getconnectedmedia.com. You hit the uh, the newsletter tab or I think we've got the prizes right up on screen there on the front page. One of them is the Epson EcoTank ET4670. This is the best printer I've used in years. And I'll tell you why, because it uses refillable ink tanks. It comes with almost two years, and depending on how much you print, more than two years of ink already in the box. Mm. You don't have to ever go and buy cartridges. And when do you end up buying cartridges? Sunday night at nine o'clock exactly. before your kid's project is due <laughs> yeah. Monday morning. Damn you cartridges. Anyway, the Epson EcoTank ET4670, it's worth 600 bucks. This thing is amazing. We also will be giving away a smartphone, the Alcatel 3V. This is a beautiful large screen smartphone from the makers uh, of TCL or the company TCL. They make all those fantastic televisions. They've been able to shrink that down into a 6.7 inch screen. It's beautiful, great for watching movies. YouTube's got a great speaker. And again, we are giving one away on our website, getconnectedmedia.com. Let's uh, talk about some of the app news, guys. Uh, you've recently had some appy hotel experience. It was a very appy hotel experience, yes. I Over the holidays, I uh, went to Portland with some friends, mm -hmm. and we got to try out a new hotel called the Radisson Red. And So like a Radisson Hotel. A Radisson Hotel. But, but this is, from the future. The from Red the version. future, yes. <laughs> yeah. it's, I guess you would call it a boutique hotel. Okay. And their premise is pretty cool. You actually do everything with their app. You can check into the room. You can check out of the room. You actually use the app as your room key. So you just launch the app and it activates your Bluetooth and then you can just hover your phone over the door and it opens. That's kind of cool. It's very cool. handy. And so, but so you have to have the app open. You have to have the app open, and it actually has a a little little uh, twirling icon to let you know that it's actually uh, active as uh, as your key. But you can also use it for things like uh, ordering room service. So, ah. so you have the whole menu. You can even, you can even order stuff when you're not in the hotel room, so that it's there when you get there. That's kind of cool. That yeah. is cool. Yeah. How many times have you lost your hotel key? <laughs> you know where I can I tell you yeah. where I lose it. In Las Vegas, during one of the big shows. Yes. And you know those hotels, right? Oh, yeah. They're yeah. going up like 10 floors, and then you walk about a mile to your room, only to find out your key is either gone or demagnetized. The worst. Or and, in the room. Or in the room. And you just want to die. <laughs> yeah. Because yes. you have to go all the way downstairs yeah. like a sucker. So now and if you lose your phone, yeah. you're hooped. But but you don't lose your phone. No, n no I mean, one does. Sorry. Yeah. You do, but you don't. So the Radisson Red. Radisson Red. Yeah. And mm. it's, it's pretty cool. There was a little glitch that we had, though. I will, I'll be fully honest. Uh, there's a brand new hotel, and they're still setting up their sort of Wi-Fi setup. In the elevator, you actually have to use your key to set your floor. One of the elevators... Because <laughs> Wi-Fi works well in elevators. Right. <laughs> so they haven't quite figured out. They did tell us that when we checked in, though. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, But it's a very cool idea, and I really like the, the ability. Because the other problem I have, too, we stay in a lot of hotels. I never remember my room number, and it's never on the key. Yeah, good point. The app tells you your room number. That's, That's a problem. Awesome. That's a problem in Las Vegas for me. Yeah. 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 Because sometimes I have my key. Yeah. And I get up to the 10th floor and I can't remember the room number and I'm wandering around like a weirdo <laughs> trying different Bad, doors. And then I still have to go down to the front desk and <laughs> what's my room number? <laughs> and, you know, are you sure you're staying at this hotel, sir? Yeah. Anyway, so good experience. Very good experience. Yeah. yeah. I would like to see this see this in other hotels. I've seen kind of incarnations of it. I remember going to a W hotel in New York one time back years ago and they had it, but it was kind of glitchy, like super glitchy. It kind of works sometimes, which if it only kind of works, like your key, <laughs> you're just like, no, done. Right. Give me, give me the, the normal key yeah. card on and there. And you could get the normal key as well. So 
We're talking about uh, online trolls later on the program here, but this is an interesting news story, and I think it can help uh, frame, uh, you know, the online trolls that we will be talking about. Instagram's using artificial intelligence to determine if a caption is considered offensive, which is cool. And that's a problem with social media, right? Because you literally have, in Facebook's case, 2 billion active users, hundreds of millions of users on Instagram. How do you, like keep track of all the crap going on and all the stupid things people are saying to each other. You, it's almost impossible. You can't have, not with, not you with, can't have humans doing it. You can't it. have human doing it. Yeah. I mean, Facebook has those little rooms of people that have to like... I know, but honestly, them. you'd have to like employ a small country, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like Latvia yeah. or Estonia, yeah. like the entire population to police yes. all of the social media. So anyway, uh, it's using AI and yeah. it's basically uh, notifying users when a caption they have written might be considered offensive. Oh, so they're helping you before you say something stupid. Well, I wonder how how much context comes into play. That's the problem, right? And yeah. and the, all the false positives, right? Yeah, so that's the problem. You know, I was I was talking to uh, one of the people that worked for us was traveling. They were going to film in the U.S. And so I was talking to them, and they were at the airport, and they were just waiting for the flight. They were in flight between connections, and I'm like, uh, "Did everything? Did everything or on the phone? Did everything go okay? Uh, yeah, everything went okay." And I go, "Okay, and are you shooting? Shooting tomorrow? Yeah, we're shooting. Shooting tomorrow." And I'm thinking to myself, "I'm saying all the weird, weird, all the, all did, the wrong words, <laughs> right? Like I'm yeah. thinking if AI is listening to this phone call, that person's not getting on the flight. No, right? Yeah, <laughs> like you're right." Yeah, so, so context. This is, yeah, this is interesting. And the reason I like it is because it's not trying to find it after the fact. Yeah. It's telling you bef before you post that caption, While you're entering. hey, uh, you shouldn't be writing this or it's it could be deemed offensive. That's creepy though. Yeah. I, I wonder if that's going to help. But is it is it better though that it's AI looking at it than a human in a room? Yeah, of course. Sort of. <laughs> might be better if like Kelly, like, you know, Mike, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> Stop drinking. Yeah. Get off your phone and go to bed. Yeah. Exactly. That would be better. Yeah, exactly. That would be better. That's us though. Anytime we're out with you though. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. Okay. We're going to talk uh, another news story here. We're uh, on the app show talking app news. Uh, TikTok. <laughs> so Steven's favorite app. Yeah. Right now, most of our <laughs> listeners are going, what? Uh, TikTok, it's a very popular social media app, uh, Chinese, but, uh, the kids are using this. This is kind of the new Snapchat, mm -hmm. really. 1.5 billion downloads. You know, coming to Canada, they're, they're, they're officially launching a Canadian side. Yeah. It. I don't know what that really means. Other than they're hiring a few people to sell more. They've got 1.5 billion, but they're looking forward to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh about that, right? Because yeah. this thing's obviously huge in, in China. Yeah. Huge. Like hundreds of millions of people are using it. And how many are they going to get in Canada? Yeah. Hundreds maybe of thousands. That, hundreds of thousands. Maybe they just like poutine. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, so they've opened up Canadian operations. Obviously, uh, from what we're reading here, it's, it's all advertising positions right now because they obviously want to get more ad dollars out of Canada. Sure. But, uh, you know, they're through, going through a lot of controversy as well. They're a Chinese company. The Americans are not loving it because of course not. They're, they're censoring a lot of the stuff over in China. And so the Americans are going, well, you can't do that. But they it's, can't. But they can. But honestly, like, like thinking about this just beyond, like, what is the next social media platform, right? You know, what's the one that's going to die off? You know, what's the next one that's going to take off? And you look at the relative age of some of these companies, when you think about it, you think about Coca-Cola and they've been around for, I don't know how many. Hundreds of years. I have to look that up, but hundreds. Yeah. But some of these companies are just, you know, they're a decade they didn't exist. And now they're the biggest thing. Six months ago, they didn't exist. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, I often think about like, what is that next platform? And maybe it's TikTok. Maybe it already is. Explain to uh, listeners what TikTok is. Well, it's basically short form video. Yeah. Um, and there's been a number of sort of uh, attempts at this previously, like uh, Vine was a very popular platform, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You know, very short, quick, uh, you know, typically you'd be like somebody falling down and it's just looping and that would be the, the shtick, right? <laughs> Right. But I've, I've watched my nieces and nephews watch the same loop over and over and over and over again. And they're just, they're, they're gutting themselves laughing. I fear for the world. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk car sharing. Is it dead? Recently car to go has pulled out of Vancouver and not only Vancouver, North America. And AJ, I know you use car to go all the time. I'm telling so you, sad. I know in the next five years, 
I, I do not uh, see great things for car sharing. As soon as Uber and Lyft get in here, <sighs> I think it's going to change things. But we're going to have a discussion about that in our thoughts. We're going to talk about the future of car sharing. And I think it's going to be dim. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, car to go one of the biggest car sharing uh, apps, uh, especially here in Whoa. Vancouver, shut down. And yeah. they shut down across North America. Crazy. Wiped out. Yeah. Overnight. Yes. And, and Vancouver was one of their biggest markets, apparently. And I'm going to tell successful. you... Successful. 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 And, I, and I'm going to tell you why. It's an easy answer why. It's an easy answer why. Because... The taxis suck here. We don't have Uber and Lyft. No. Nope. And cars are freaking expensive. Yep. But Uber and Lyft are coming. I know, I know. In the next few months, I'm cautiously optimistic. But I'm, I'm telling you, that's what's going to do in car sharing in general. I have a conspiracy theory. Okay. <laughs> well, so I think that uh, two things. One is um, the competitor in Vancouver, which is uh, Evo. Yeah. Um, got permission to park in all the metered spaces. They got permission or they negotiated that? Well, they they negotiated whatever. They Maybe they're paying for it. But my yeah. point is, is that Cargo didn't have that. And that's yet another stab against them because it instantly for the consumer makes a huge difference if you can just park anywhere. And having to park in one of those little lots and then you're on the roof and you're taking the elevator down. I mean, I'm just saying... That but is how does, huge. How does, okay, huge. How, how does That's, Laura, one of our staffers here, she always gets parking tickets with her Evo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where get, is she parking? <laughs> let's not talk about Laura and on, her technical on proficiency. On the Granville okay? Street Bridge. Let's not, let's not pick up Laura and her technical okay. proficiency. Oh, no. So I hear you. Okay. I hear you. That's convenient. Yeah. However, car to go shut down everything in North America. I know. You're right. You're so, right. So... But Evo's just here in Vancouver. I know you're right. That was my the small my. But anyway, the other the other part of it was I would like to see the purchase price for Share Now to buy this out and the value of the fleet. Who's buying them out? No, so Share Now buys buys uh, Cartago. Yeah, right. What's the value of the fleet? Do you know what I mean? Not much. So you buy it. Well, I wonder if it's more than the purchase price. You'd have to look at it, but mm. uh, were they buying them just to sell them? Well, they just sold them. They bought them and then they sold them. Yeah. I so, love those Mercedes. I'm going to miss. Is what, the little smart cars? Sure now. No, no, the big ones. Oh, they had big ones. Oh, yeah. You had the premium. You could rent a beautiful Mercedes coupe and drive it around. Really? Yeah. Like a boss. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you're a loser because they're gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Back, to the, in, back to the Prius. <laughs> you're, in a, you're in a bicycle. So what does this say about the future of car sharing, though? Uh, in my opinion, once Uber and Lyft hit a city, I would imagine that would wipe out a lot of the car sharing because- oh. To me, that's just way more convenient to click on an app and hop in an Uber and not have to worry about parking or anything. The, the big thing about the uh, car sharing network is that there's a lot of people that use it very sporadically because they don't like driving. They don't own a car. Mm -hmm. And so those aren't necessarily the best drivers on the road either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, I think the idea of having a ride hailing service is much more attractive for that audience. Yeah. <laughs> for citizens in general. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. <laughs> On the streets. It's not a bad, pedestrian or driver. <laughs> yeah. It's I not just a hate bad. being a passenger with someone that hasn't driven a lot. <laughs> in the Okay, so I'm I'm just talking Vancouver. I don't know all the other ones in the other cities, but uh, now we've got Zipcar, yeah, Moto, yeah, yep, and Evo. In the next three years, at least one, maybe all of them will be gone. I think there is an opportunity for a different kind of car show though. Okay. And Are you going to share that? I'm going to share it. <laughs> I think that uh, you it's going to be, it's gonna be, and I know that I know some car companies are talking about doing this. I haven't seen it done right yet, but you basically buy a car share between you and like six other people that live nearby. Like condo living is a perfect example, right? You don't need a car all the time. You basically all buy a car together and you just share it between a small group of people. Okay, I've been sharing one car with my wife for the past <laughs> few years, and I'm telling you, it's not going well. Okay, but you still have the app. You still book it. You still have all that. Oh, okay, know. yeah. So if I had an app, my wife and I would be getting along. Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure. So <laughs> think of Airbnb for cars, right? Like, yep. if you want to use my car, I can let I can rent it to you. But isn't that Turo? Car, car yeah, sharing? no, I think. But what AJ means is like you have one car or multiple cars for a complex. Yeah. For people to share. Okay, for a condo, for example. Yes, yeah. 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 So you take the truck one day, I take the electric, you know, okay. blah, blah, Kind of blah. like how the hotels have their own cars yeah, sometimes. like that. So would Stratus set that up, perhaps? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you're in a strata. Yeah. You could be a leader. I could be a leader in it. Yeah. 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 A lot of work. <laughs> and nowhere to park it. <laughs> and, no, and no pay. <laughs> I, yeah, I can imagine just yeah. how much. But so uh, I guess in my opinion, car sharing, I think, is going to be a minor way of people getting around. Yeah, I still think I, th- I still think there's going to be a market for it, especially for the you know, the the weird trip to IKEA that you need something mm-hmm, you know and you don't mm-hmm. want to rent a car. Yeah, but you can kind of temporarily rent a car. Those kinds of trips. Yeah. Um, but also, I think that's also an opportunity for you know the Uber or Lyft guy with a big truck. <laughs> yeah, we need autonomous driving essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's coming. I mean, that's. Yeah. Elon Musk stream with Teslas in the self-driving yeah. mode. Yeah. He wants to turn all the Teslas into a giant taxi fleet, essentially, right. yeah. like a self-driving taxi fleet. You own a Tesla, you want to make a little money on the side when your car is just sitting in your driveway, it'll just take off and pick up passengers by itself, and you'll get a cut of that. <laughs> yeah, and lots more stuff in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that GM was actually pushing a steering wheel less Chevy Volt. Ah. To be uh, certified, right? Specifically for that self-driving purpose. I think they should have steering wheels. It's going to be an exciting two years. I think so. Yeah. Okay, we've got a lot going on today's program. We have a fantastic uh, guest coming up in a little bit. Uh, her name is Jordan Kramer. She is a media anthropologist, and she has done studies uh, about online digital trolls. And this is becoming a big problem. Everything's so polarized online and people are trolls anyway, uh, are these anonymous type people that go after and harass folks in online forums, whether those are chat rooms or social media like Facebook, Instagram. Well, they're getting organized even more so now and really going after some of the uh, vulnerable parts of society. And it's a fascinating look into that. And we're also going to see what can we do about it. Uh, we've talked about trolls in the past. And John, tell, tell the listeners again what a troll is. Not the kind that live under a bridge, but <laughs> maybe they do from a digital perspective. Yeah, well, they're typically people that spend a lot of time and effort making someone else's life miserable online. Yeah, and uh, it's unfortunate it's been around since uh, the internet really has uh, bubbled up, especially with all the different communication uh, mediums we have now from all the different messenger platforms, uh, the social media uh, areas as well, like Facebook and Twitter and Twitch and, and what have you. Which makes it much easier for those trolls to have a much broader voice to make someone's life very difficult by calling them out, calling them names, uh, shaming them, all kinds of different ways that uh, it can manifest itself. Well, uh, we've got an interesting guest on the line. Uh, Her name is uh, Jordan Kramer. She is a media anthropologist. And uh, we're going to be talking today uh, about trolls, digital trolls. Uh, They're teaming up and, uh, you know, tech platforms aren't uh, doing enough uh, to stop them. Thanks for joining us, uh, Jordan. Thank you. Hi. Uh, First of all, what is a media anthropologist? Um, That's a great question. I'm a a cultural anthropologist, so that means I don't study um, stones and bones. I study uh, human culture and cultural variation, but I really look at things like uh, media technologies, and I study how people use social media in their everyday lives. So uh, we're talking about trolls uh, today. Uh, Is there a certain uh, area of the population or populations uh, that uh, are more uh, vulnerable to this? Yeah, and that's the real issue. Um, for this research that we did, we did this study. Um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Glabo, and I at the um, Implosion Labs, we worked with the Anti-Defamation League, and um, they wanted to understand the experience of uh, of being trolled. So a number of researchers have looked at trying to understand trolls themselves, but we really wanted to look at not just the quantitative experience of um uh, of trolling, but the, the sort of everyday lived experience of it. And we really found that um, and and past research backs this up as well, as well that um, people who are uh, um, tend to be targeted basically based on their identity. So women, people of color, and people, and particularly at the intersection of multiple uh, marginalized identities like uh, women of color and trans women, uh, are really disproportionately affected um, not just by trolling but by uh, identity-based trolling. Um, so misogynistic. Um, uh, anti-Semitic uh, and racist attacks. 
Are there certain platforms uh, that are used more than others for this, or is it just right across the board? You know, it's pretty across the board, and I think it um, happens a lot on, on social media is uh, the main place where you see this, certainly um, on, on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, also disproportionately, I think, in gaming, in online gaming. Um, so we talked to a number of Twitch um, streamers, and particularly for women and trans women on, on Twitch, which is a platform for streaming uh, video game play. Um, that was a, a, a main site of harassment that we, uh, that we observed. Um, but yeah, social media, but, um, but plat- um, harassment spreads pretty quickly into blog comment sections, into, uh, into, into email, even to text messaging, and it could spill over to, um, to, to your phone, um, and even in person harassment. So what what kind of what kind of things can people do to stop this? Um, because it sounds like a lot of these platforms aren't doing enough to, uh, you know, they'll they'll report these problem people, but nothing gets done, yeah. and, they, and they continue to have a voice. Or in 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 sort of the the gist of your your research was that some of these trolls are actually uh, teaming up. Yeah, so absolutely, and I think that in fact that's you know I was thinking about this. It's been true since. Um, you know, you were mentioning at the beginning, um, trolling goes back to the dawn of the internet, and that's absolutely true. Um, and, and our, we were researching, um, kind of the, uh, previous studies that have been done. And when you go back and look at the, the history of, of trolling, um, to some degree, it was always, um, uh, trolling campaigns or coordinated attacks. But what's new, I think, is that so many more people are online and so many more people use social media and they use it professionally. Um, so, um, you know, some of the potential harms here were not just um, that it's unpleasant to be uh, harassed online, sure, um, but it really keeps people out of public space online. Um, uh, and it can harm people who depend on um, sites like Twitter to build up professional reputations and, and make uh, new connections. Um, but in terms of what people can do, uh, this was one of the issues that we found just time and again. Is everybody we spoke to had been, um, uh, you know, had had taking advantage of the existing tools to try to report their harassment. Um, I'm sure sites like Twitter and Facebook, they let you flag harassment and abusers and, uh, and sometimes they'll block people. But for the most part, because um, the kind of, uh, of trolling that we are looking at is, um, is what we call networked harassment. So it takes place both across multiple platforms and it's coordinated um, often informally, um, but by multiple users and particularly on sites like 4chan and Reddit um, where people will say, hey, you know, uh, somebody's posting, you know, critiques of, um, of white nationalism or, you know, some feminist complained about gender in, in, a, in a video game. Uh, go, go post swastikas. Go harass the social justice warriors. Um, and so it's, it's really hard for platforms to, um, to respond to this harassment when the nature of the harassment is to take place by definition across Facebook and Twitter and, um, you know, um, instant messaging. Um, so, so everybody documented their, almost everybody we spoke to documented their abuse in detail. You know, they kept files of the you know, screenshots or they even one person created spreadsheets. Um, but generally speaking, um, blocking a few users doesn't stop the harassment. Um, and even, even approaching law enforcement, law enforcement usually can't do much. Especially if they're coordinating these attacks on a different platform as well. You know, exactly. And that's, um, so one of the issues, for example, is often um, targeted harassment comes from, like I said, from sites like 4chan, um, and it, 4chan is anonymous, so there's no way to, to connect the, the Twitter user necessarily to um, their identity uh, on, on 4chan. Um, but there are ways to do it. So, for example, IP filtering can allow you, and I think some sites like Medium offer better control. And one of the things we found that was that sites like Discord and Medium that offer better moderation tools for users did have a, a lower levels of this kind of harassment. Um, but um, uh, things like IP filtering uh, are a way that you could actually say, okay, or no, referral filtering is what I meant. And you can actually say, you know what, don't let any um, any users coming in from basically from 4chan right now uh, comment on my Medium post. Um, and that can be a way to actually stop this kind of uh, harassment. Did you come across any patterns as far as age of the trolls and their targets? Like, is it predominantly a younger audience yeah. that are doing this with lots of time on their hands? Or is it people of all ages that are? 
Yeah. You know, it's such an interesting question because the research that had that had been done in the past um, definitely shows that young people are more likely to be targets of cyber harassment and cyber bullying. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because although um, whether or not young people are being targeted because they're young or because they are, I don't know, more likely to be in these kinds of online spaces, you know, that's something that um, is still unclear to me. But um, I think that the, the portrait we have of trolls is certainly that they're younger, they're more likely to be male, maybe more likely to be white, so not necessarily. Um, and I think that was true, but it wasn't always true. Um, pretty much all the harassers were, uh, as far as we knew, were male. Although, again, we often don't know the identity of these harassers. Um, but um, uh, but they weren't necessarily all um, younger. And I think that um, um, you know that might push back a little bit against the stereotype. Yeah, I guess it depends on the platform that the harassment's happening on. Because maybe, you know, on Twitch, when they're watching Fortnite, where the harassment happens, it skews younger versus uh, totally. somewhere else, maybe more professional or, or an older audience. So we talked about these different. Well, exactly. Yeah. We, we talked about yeah. these different platforms, um, you know, cracking down on this. Can they crack down more? You know, can they do a better job? Yeah. And um, one of the things that's really helpful when you focus on um, the actual experiences of people, um, and this is one of the benefits of, of bringing anthropology to this question, is not just thinking about um, surveying people to um, understand the question quantitatively, which is also important, but when you talk to people in, um, about their everyday experiences, um, you can start to hear that people who are harassed have a lot of really good ideas about what to do about it. Um, and... Um, you know, Twitch uh, users in particular, um, women and transgender women on, on Twitch that we spoke to, um, had a lot of really concrete ideas. And so some of the things that um, that we recommend in, in our study, um, first of all, is to improve uh, moderation tools and filtering tools. Um, and one way to do this is to allow um, uh, uh, basically like distributed moderation. And people do this on, on Discord already, but you can have a team of volunteer moderators, um, basically friends or other users um, who help you um, you know, on your Twitch channel, help prevent the harassers from uh, from coming in, ban them as they come in, um, and that's that's great. But it's also really stressful, and it can be very exhausting for the uh, for the moderators to do. Um, but certainly, empowering the users um, to have more control over their own profile, over who can see them. Um, uh, in particular, sites like uh, Twitter have gotten better about um, blocking, not just allowing you to block or mute your harasser, but make sure they can't keep seeing you. Um, one of the problems on a site like Twitch is often um, uh, you can block people from um, harassing you on your channel, but that doesn't mean they can't see what you're doing and, and post about you elsewhere. We had a couple of really extreme examples where um, uh, people just created a false uh, uh, profile for someone they had been targeting, uh, pretended to be her, impersonated her, um, defaced her image, um, and uh, was really hurtful to her. Um uh, and a couple of other of our recommendations. One is um, the, the reporting process is just totally inadequate right now. You know, you, you flag somebody, you don't really understand what happens to the um, to your to your claim. Maybe you're asked to provide some evidence, and then you get a response. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly reported people on on Twitter and Facebook before. Um, it's not very satisfying, and it's not very transparent. So, increasing transparency, um, for example, some kind of uh, uh, reporting uh, portal that would you actually allow you to actually track your claim. Um, um, and see um, how it's being responded to. Um, that would be uh, the second uh, main recommendation. But lastly, we found that you know one of the issues with I think technology design more broadly is that it's designed by people who are not necessarily the targets of this kind of harassment. So incorporating or including the perspective um, of people who are harassed um, in the design of uh, technology is um, a, a really crucial. Um, crucial thing. Um, and along with that, training designers and staff already to better understand harassment. Because if you never experienced it, you might not really understand how, for example, often it's the context rather than the content um, of harassment that matters. We need to see more, um, not just collaborating with communities who are the targets of harassment, but also including um, you know, hiring designers who are themselves um, more diverse to bring their perspectives to, to the process of, of technology design. We're talking with Jordan Kramer. She is a media anthropologist. 
I now know what a media anthropologist is. Uh, Jordan, uh, this is this is great work, and uh, I, I got to say, I appreciate uh, that uh, you know you've put time into studying this and really bringing this to uh, not just our attention but everyone's attention. There's a great article on fastcompany.com uh, uh, giving a little more detail about uh, Jordan's uh, experience and study here uh, as well. So I recommend uh, the listeners to check that out uh, as well. Jordan, again, thanks so much uh, for coming on the program. Well, thank you so much. Don't forget to hit the website. We're giving away an Epson EcoTank printer, the 4670. $600. It's worth 600 bucks, And an Alcatel 3V smartphone. Getconnectedmedia.com. Subscribe to our e-newsletter and you are in for all the contests that we have going on this year. It's uh, John's pick of the week. What do you got for apps? Google Keep. Cool. Oh, yeah, I use it. This is a free app available for Android and iOS. And it's a simple note-taking app without all the overwhelming features of its competitors. While it appears just to be a scrolling list of notes, um, it actually keeps, Keep has some very powerful features to make it really useful. You can add labels to your notes. So if you're familiar with Gmail, this is a really familiar feature. And the search function uh, in this app is nothing short of what you'd expect from Google. So it searches all of the text you've entered, but also anything that you've put inside your images, your voice memos, it'll actually search inside that as well, which is really cool. You can also collaborate with others using Keep, and it integrates really well with other Google apps, such as Reminders. So you can set a reminder and have a much deeper dive note associated with that all within keep and you i've i gotta be honest i've never heard of this app oh really? well it's it's yeah. it comes um almost like stock on an android phone yeah so it's sort of like there when you yeah. when you get your android phone and so it's just an, it's like an evernote type type thing uh, but it's a handy and because it's tied into the google ecosystem it actually makes it uh if you if you're a lister uh, it's a great little tool. It's also on the right hand side of your Gmail. If you if you use uh, Gmail or G Suite, mm-hmm. uh, it's available there as well. And it's just it's just always there, and it's really handy way of keeping notes. Here's my, here's a question for you. Speaking of app of the week, um, what about like iTunes? So on Apple TV, for example. Yeah. So how why can't you load that on some other device? You know, like Prime Video, I can get it on my phone, I can get it on the web, I can get it on the on a set top box. Yeah. Netflix, same thing. Well, it's Apple TV now. I know, but can't Apple, they just Apple TV Plus. share a little bit out there? No. Okay. You gotta be an Apple TV Plus. I wanna give another shout out uh, for another app that uh, Mark Hagenson oh, yeah. told us about or told me about. Uh, he's the man behind uh, Converse Story. Cool app for Android. You gotta check that out. Uh, but he, uh, he sent me a message uh, this week and said, check out Marine Traffic. Uh, he lives in West Vancouver, so he's always looking out at the uh, the ocean. I'm very jealous. Uh, this app will tell you all the ships that are coming into the harbor in real time. That's cool. So you can track your package from eBay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they're not sh- sending it via, via ship. <laughs> Most of the time when you buy stuff from China, that's how it comes. This is true. But yeah, no, it'll tell you uh, all the different boats and their names and it's it's really crazy. That is cool. And the details, yeah. I used to work at the shipyards. I used to fill grain in el- at the at the grain elevators. We used to load ships with grain. And you're still alive. Yeah, and so, but this is this is a good example. You can see that what grain is going in what ship and where it's going to. This is cool. I'm just looking at it right now. It tells you the speed or whether it's at anchor, uh, where it's flagged and where it's going. This is really neat. It's kind of like lost. a flight tracker, but for boats. Yeah. For boats, yeah. yeah. So if you live uh, on the coast... And if you like boats, you got to check this out. Thanks, Mark. Mark Hagenson, the guy behind Converse Story. That's all the time we have left. Don't forget to hit our website to find out all the latest tech news and check out our video podcast. You can see us. We post these shows uh, up there on our YouTube channel and Facebook, and you can get all the links there. And you can enter our contest by subscribing to our e-newsletter, giving away an Epson EcoTank 4670 printer and an Alcatel 3V smartphone. I want to thank all the folks that helped put the show together. Christina, Stephen, AJ, Mike, that's me, John, <laughs> <laughs> Graham somewhere. This is Mike, John, and AJ logging off. We'll see you again next time.